Offering's Promise has been in existence for like 16 years now. The, what inspired you to become the, the founder and director of an international charity? Well, in about 20 years ago, my husband and I wound up, while in our 50s, adopting three sisters from Ukraine. Uh, we had four children at the time, and our youngest son, I think, was about 12, 13. So we thought our family was complete, but we heard yeah. the story of these three young girls and just felt like God was nudging us to go. You know, our fear was that they were going to be split up. And family has always been really important to my husband and myself. And we just thought, my goodness, there's a reason they're in an orphanage. Now somebody's going to come along from perhaps different countries even and split these sisters up. And and our hearts just were burdened. I can't explain it other than that. I mean, literally, I, I found myself waking up in the middle of the night and um, just praying for them, that God would send someone to get them. I didn't think it would be me. <laughs> <laughs> I was sort of just asking him to send somebody to yeah. get these girls. And then I began to get that kind of crazy feeling you get when God's asking you to jump off the cliff without knowing what's at the bottom. <laughs> And so we did that. You know, we, it was quite a, I mean, I'm, I'm simplifying the whole process, but seeing them over there, seeing uh, there were 350 kids in the orphanage they were in, and less than 1% of children that are in orphanages around the world will ever be adopted. And so as we drove away, we wound up saying, okay, we have three new daughters, but what about all those kids whose noses yeah. are pressed up against the window saying, when is somebody yeah. coming for me? And on top of that, we learned the statistic, Dale, that um, kids age out of orphanages at 16. They have no life skills. They don't know how to do their laundry. They've never had to manage money. They don't know how to cook. They're given a small stipend, and they're just sent out the front door. And so we started saying, what could we do to make a difference in the lives of these kids? And we said, well, what would give them like a leg up from everybody else? And we thought, well, if they could speak English and they would be bilingual, that would be good. If they knew how to function with computers, that would be good. And some life skills like the things I've talked about. But also we felt like if you can help kids with all of that, but if you don't give them a purpose and an understanding of the value of their lives, so we, we thought we need to talk to them about who is God in relationship to them? Who are they in relationship to God? What does that have to do with their life and their future? And we called it the School of Life. And we just started establishing, these were for kids who were about to age out or who had aged out. And we rented space initially and we just started holding classes and the kids came because we fed them. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> and, and then it just began to develop from there. Um, now I see with things going on in the world today that strategically we are in 19 centers in Ukraine plus other ministry work around the whole country. We're in Poland, we're in Romania, uh, we're in Moldova, we're in Hungary. And so I, I feel like for all the work that's been done for these last 16, 17 years, really we're strategically positioned for what's happening today. God's like that, you know. Yeah. What a wonderful story. Drew, talk to me about your background. How, how did you become involved with the organization? Well, I, you know, I have a background in in marketing in general. Um, I was kind of there for for the whole story, as Mom just <laughs> mentioned. I was there when we adopted the girls, and it was at the time I was getting ready to head to college, so it seemed a little bit crazy to me, to be honest, that we were bringing three more kids <laughs> into a family of four kids already. Um, but I don't think any of us understood at the time what was happening and the importance of that adoption and what it would mean. Um, and so as Orphan's Promise grew and I developed my skills in marketing and that kind of thing, it became pretty clear um, that there was a need to help tell the Orphan's Promise story. And so I began talking to mom about seven years ago about coming and in, being involved with Orphan's Promise and got on board. I kind of called it coming back home to the family business because yeah. we've always <laughs> had adopted kids and this is just kind of part of what we do. And it's really been a thrill. Uh, again, it's a passion of moms and I think you know, I've kind of adopted that as my own passion as well. And so being able to see it begin with my sisters, but now, uh, you know, not only are we spread in Ukraine, we're in 350 different projects in 68 countries. Wow. So to be a part of that growth and to see how the ministry has expanded over the across the world has been pretty awesome. Yeah. And, and Terry, you said you saw this on TV. I, 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 you just you saw the Well, no, you know what happened? I was doing a talk show for CBN uh, and called Living the Life. And the first guest that came on was just a human interest story. And she and her husband were uh, retirement age. And they said, well, we can go live comfortably on a golf course, or we can 
she spoke a little Russian. She said, we can go to Ukraine and we can adopt an older child. And they opted to do that. It was such a fascinating story to me because of the four children that we had that Drew mentioned earlier, two were biological and two were adopted. But the two that were adopted came as infants. One came from uh. Korea. I have a son that's a mixed son that's American adoption. And so adopting an older child, I thought, how do you do that? Do you line them all up against the wall and you say, I'll take number seven? I mean, I just, yeah. it was very hard for me to imagine that. So we said to her, when you come back, come with your child and we'd like to meet your child and and hear what your story was about. And when she came back, she brought the story of three sisters that were there. And when they first came to adopt, the orphanage director wanted her to take all three sisters. And they said, well, we can't. We came for one and we only have permission for two. So the orphanage director excused herself and left the room. Sorry, this always touches me when I tell this. She came back and she said, well, the oldest sister said she would stay behind so her younger oh. sisters could have a family. Well, I mean, we're all weeping, you know, yeah. in, the, in the production meeting. And that was the story that stuck with me, Dale, where I, I wound up saying, wow, what happens to kids like this? Yeah. You know, you mentioned Ukraine. We've all seen the images on TV and the tremendous impact on, on children. You started in Ukraine and expanded far beyond Ukraine today. Uh, guys, talk to me about what Offering, Offering's Promise looks like today and your involvement in Ukraine. Yeah, I think maybe I'll, I'll start that just because I've been working pretty closely with a lot of our team there. Um, we have 19 centers in Ukraine, as Mom mentioned. And as of right now, even despite the war, 15 centers are still operational. Um, they've shifted things a little bit. We're still ministering to children. We're still feeding and educating kids. But one of the most important things we're doing is we've become like a refugee center in those 15 different locations. So people are using us um, as a place to kind of stop and rest and find shelter and safety, to get a warm meal, to take a shower, to get their bearings before they begin to head on and look into places like Poland and Romania and Hungary mm -hmm. where they try and find something more permanent. You know, a lot of the people who left early had places to go. They had family in those other countries. They had places they could stay. They had money to make it happen. Now you're seeing Ukrainians come across into our centers that don't know where they're going. And so they're staying with us for days and even weeks at times. So those centers have really shifted um, to become sort of a source of hope for people as they're really fleeing yeah. traumatic experiences. Homes being bombed, loved ones being lost. Um, and they come to our shelters and they find a message of hope. They find a warm meal. They find a, a warm bed to sleep in. Um, and they find people who really care. The, the really cool thing about what God's been doing through Orphan's Promise in Ukraine is for almost 20 years, he's established that network for us. So we have staff members, volunteers, churches we partner with. We didn't have to go to Ukraine yeah. to start ministering. We were already there. And so we've been able to just open our doors to people who are really in trouble um, and offer them a really safe place. And it's been great to see how um, our donors have really stepped up to the plate and began to invest in our work there because we're doing twice as much work now as we did three months ago. I can imagine. Um, and so being able to feed these people, being able to house these, house these people is expensive, but it's it's a passion we have. And the Ukrainian people that we work with, our staff members, are heroes, honestly. Many of them have taken their kids to the border, sent them into Lithuania, into Romania, into Poland to go be safe, and they turn right around and go back into the country to keep serving people. Um, you know, the Ukrainians have been through a lot throughout history. Um, and they're not willing to give up their freedom. They've they've fought long and hard for it, and they're going to stay as long as they possibly can. And they care deeply about their people, and they're a people of faith. So for us to be there now, we are still, I mean, really, in, if you were to see a map across the country, we still have 15 locations still functioning. Um, and we're doing things like uh, planting vegetables in the western part of Ukraine to feed thousands of refugees, baking bread to feed thousands of refugees. Uh, these are just things that happen as a part of our daily operations, and we've had to shift them now to feed refugees. Um, but I think the impact is just tremendous. Hmm. I want to say also that in other countries, you know, Dale, when we looked at this in the beginning, in Ukraine it was different because our girls were from there, and so we were familiar with the country. But in other countries, we're not starting in the same way that we did in Ukraine. We're working with existing successful programs that are happening there, often through the local church, because they're usually very involved in the, the community and people see them as a place of respite. Um, but the program stays the same. We're, do, we're feeding kids, we're teaching kids. Um, and what we've seen that's exploded for us that I'm not sure we realized in the beginning would happen, because we work with orphaned and vulnerable children, 
We work with kids who come from families that are vulnerable because of poverty. There might be alcoholism or violence or something in the family. The families are coming, especially in some of the remote areas where the parents might not read or write either. And then they've come and said, can you teach us? And so we're seeing family restoration. And the reason that's so important is because that's what keeps kids out of orphanages. Lots of kids in orphanages have parents. They just can't afford to raise them or they're not healthy enough to raise them. And so they send them to a school or an orphanage. And our goal is to, uh, in addition to working with orphans, to take kids that are vulnerable from at risk to thriving. And if that involves involving their families in that process, then, then their families get involved too. Guess what's the biggest challenge you face? I, th I would say the biggest challenge <laughs> is um, that poverty and, mm -hmm. and vulnerability looks different in every, every country. In other words, a, a vulnerable child in America looks very different than a vulnerable child in Kenya or a vulnerable child in Ukraine. Um, in many places, there is just simply a lack of access to technology, to education, to resources. In other places, there's a, there's a I mean, in, for instance, Ukraine is not a third world country by any stretch of the imagination. And yet many people in Ukraine don't have access to those things because they've grown up in in terrible situations because of alcoholism, as mom mentioned. So I think the biggest challenge is trying to identify a solution for each of those scenarios. But that's why we work with great partners is because we don't want to come in and just be this, you know, great American hope where we come in and put our stamp on it and say, hey, we got we've got the solution. Wait till, you know, we tell you what we're going to do. We work with people on the ground who know the communities, who know the children, who know the needs um, and and help us then identify how do we support that? How do we fund that? How do we make that you know applicable to these kids? So I would say that's the biggest challenge is just figuring out in each area where we go in 68 different countries, how do we come up with a solution that helps kids in each of those different scenarios? Yeah, I think the other thing would be number one, building trust with people because when people um, feel like they're looked down upon or they don't have or they're judged by their circumstances, building trust with them so that they come. And, and one of the ways that we're committed to doing that is where we stay. We're there. We're committed to the, per, the projects and the partners that we work with. And so these aren't just one-off deals where we send a check or we, I mean, we know the people that are involved. We have regional directors around the world that oversee all of these projects. And there's that we've built a family. And, you know, it's, we've built what we're trying to create, yeah. <laughs> you know, in other people's lives. There's people who care and are there to stay and uh, in a world where sometimes handouts are fast and easy, relationship, we're all about relationship, relationship, relationship. We care about you. We care about what's happening to you. And we're not going to come in from America and say, this is the way we do it. Do it our way. We're going to work with your people in your country about what works for you. But then with that, we always are sure that we bring the gospel message of You've been created with intention and purpose, and there is a God who loves you and wants to be involved in your life. And we've seen it change kids' lives in a radical, kids who've been traumatized in a radical way. Well, uh, we'll talk about how you select okay. projects and who do you work with. Yeah, so, you know, we receive hundreds of applications every single year um, from projects that are ongoing and that want support. And so the way we, we really vet those projects is we have tremendous people in the field. We have a, we have a staff in the field of coordinators and managers that go to those projects and um, see what they're doing and they review the work and make sure that it's legitimate, that it's above board. We never want to take you know money that's been donated and give it to a, to a project that we can't trust or that we don't believe in. So that's kind of the first step is how do we, you know, we review projects firsthand. We, we, we get to know those projects. Uh, the second step is there's a leadership team, my mom and myself, our development director, our director of operations. You know, we sit down and look at those things and consider our budget. What do we think we can raise in terms of money to support these kids in these programs? Um, and then every year we make decisions about those things. And it's hard. There are, there are times where we have to turn projects away and say, man, this seems like a really great work, but we just don't have the budget for yeah. it this year. Um, there's other times where we do have the budget and we're thrilled and excited to say to people, yes, please, we want to work with you. Uh, we believe the work you're doing is worthwhile and we know it can change kids' lives. Um, so that's really the process. They they request help and we do our legwork and our homework to figure out if this makes sense for us as an organization, if it aligns with our beliefs and our values. And then when we say yes, we're all in. We jump in and we provide supervision, we provide training, we provide oversight. Uh, it's a really a partnership with all the programs that we work with. 1% of children in orphanages will be adopted, which means there's 99% that are never going to have a, f a forever family. Um, 
those kids need help. That was our question. Yeah. If, if 99% are not going to be adopted, what happens to those kids? And so we began to look at solutions that addressed their, their needs in the countries where they live, in the okay. communities where they live. And I think if I were to tell you what separates us, um, we don't do one thing. We're not a clean water organization. We're not just a feeding organization. We're not just an education organization. We take a holistic approach. We work with communities on the ground who already know those, those problems and those solutions. And we're able to connect donors in America who have a passion to help children with solutions on the ground that actually okay. make a long-term difference in these kids' lives. You know, yeah. I'll, I'll tell you, it's been so crazy, Dale. The first, when we first started this, it was myself and one other gal and who's now our director of operations. And for two years, we just walked and prayed, walked and prayed, said, God, we're two little women. We want to make a difference in the lives of these kids. What do we do? And I, you know, <laughs> I was at a, um, a meeting where someone had asked me to come and speak on behalf of their fundraiser. So I would never have have brought this issue in. We didn't even know what we were going to do at that point. But at the end of my message, I felt like I was supposed to go back and say, will you all pray for me? It was a Christian organization. This is what we're looking at. And we're just, we don't even know how, what that, what the structure of that would look like. But would you pray for us that we would, we would find an open door? A guy that I barely knew, I had met maybe a couple of times, but not even to sit down and talk as long as you and I have talked here, at the end of the evening came up and was just weeping. I mean, couldn't even speak to me and put something in my hand and walked away. And it was a check for $50,000. It was, for me, it was like God was saying, you do the legwork, I'm going to supply what you need. Well, then at the time, we were thinking that we had to form our own 501c3, and then Gordon Robertson said, why don't you come under the umbrella of CBN? You can be our outreach to children around the world. And he said, the problem is, I don't have a budget for you. And I said, it's okay. I've seen what God can do. I I'll, I'll, I'll go with him. <laughs> and so we started that way. But what he did allow us to do was tell the orphan story when our donors, our CBN donors would gather. And God would speak to the hearts of people who had a heart for children and they would give. And CBN's very good that way. If you give to something specific, you know, whether it's Operation Blessing, Disaster Relief, or Orphan's Promise, or Water Wells, whatever it is, your, your money goes where you have said you want it to go. And so bit by bit, we just began to tell more and more of the story. And the more we told the story, the more it grew. No one's more flabbergasted about where it's at today than me, because <laughs> I never saw this happening. I never had a, I didn't have a vision for this. Really? You know, no, not at all. Yeah. I just wanted to help, help some of my kids' friends back in Ukraine who were never going to find families. Yeah. And that was really the crux of starting it. But now I think about that and I think we are raising children to be leaders in their nations, children to understand that they have value, teaching children to dream. I do believe that God's going to take that generation of children, some, many of them in countries that are in serious crisis, yeah. and raise them to the top, like cream coming to the top of the, the heap, and they will be great leaders in their countries. Drew, what's next for, our, for, for Orphan's Promise? We, we're not leaving Ukraine anytime soon, <laughs> I can tell you that. We've been there yeah. roughly, like I said, 20 years. And uh, we plan to be there for at least the next 50 and hopefully long, long after that. Uh, you know, this is a movement, as mom has mentioned many times, uh, that God is kind of directing. So until he says stop, we don't have any plans to stop. And we have every intention to keep growing. I will tell you this, Dale, the need right now, and not only in Ukraine, but around the world is as great as it's ever been. Um, there seems to be an ever increasing gap between those who have and those yeah. who have not. And those who have not are who we go and meet the needs of. And so I would tell you that as long as people continue to um, have a passion to help children, uh, as they share our passion for that, we've got a great group of donors that support us. We're always looking for more, um, but there's a great group that really support us. Um, and as long as that need is there and as long as God allows us to continue, we're going to keep going and meeting that need. And so um, I would say we're in uh, 68 countries today, and Lord willing, that'll be 75 or 100 in the future. Um, you know, this is this is mom's passion now. It's also her legacy. Um, she is leaving a legacy across the world. And as her oldest son, I have every intention of letting the legacy carry on for as long as I possibly can. So we're not going to stop. 
Um, and we believe it's a worthwhile cause and we know God's behind it. Can I say, I want to say one other thing because yeah. we, it sounds like we're all, we're out there working in third world countries and we are in many places, second world, like in Ukraine. And, but we're also in the United States and we have lots of donors who say, so what are you doing here? Are you always out there? Are you always outside of our country? And we're not, we're here in the United States doing all kinds of projects with young people who come out of troubled backgrounds. Um, not, they're not orphaned technically, mm -hmm. but they are orphaned in opportunity. And so we are doing job career things with some of them, um, teaching them the very things that lots of kids don't learn in school because they can't learn if they're coming from a compromised background. Um, you know, just creating relationship with them. We're involved in trafficking measures, lots of that going on in our country, sad to say. And so we're involved with wonderful ministries who are helping some of these young women and children come out of that, get some healing from the trauma of that and move forward with their lives. Guys, what do you want our audience to know about the work you're doing? Well, uh, and, and more importantly, how can they learn more yeah. and how can they, su you, they support your work? Yeah, so uh, you can learn more by going to orphanspromise.org. It's a great website with a lot of resources. Uh, you certainly could check out our Facebook page or our YouTube channel. Um, I think what I would want people to know is, uh, again, we're not just here for the short term in any of these places. We don't come in uh, for three months or six months and drop some money in a community and then wish them well and move on our merry way. Many of the programs that we are in, in partnership with, we've been partners with for 10, 12, 15 years. Now we're accepting new partners every year, but I mentioned that length because I think it's important to understand um, we have kids and mom and I can tell you a number of stories where we met them as grade school children. Yeah. And today they're married with children of their own. They've got college wow. educations. Wow. And so because we're involved for that length of time, it's really rewarding on this end to get to see the full scope of that. We've got a number of kids, particularly in Ukraine, who came out of those training centers, ended up getting an education and are now back running our training centers or as volunteers or staff members at our training centers. So the solutions that we're trying to create and fund and provide, again, are not just, I wanna feed a kid for a week. I wanna feed a kid for a year. We wanna give that kid a life. We wanna help that child thrive. And so if I wanted some people to know anything about us, that would be it. We are making deep, long-term investments in the lives of these kids. Mm -hmm. And we see the fruit of that investment. We see that paying off and these lives are transformed by the love that they receive. I would say also that um, one of the one of the places that most touches my heart that we're in, it's not a place, it's a group of communities, would be the Roma or Gypsy community in Eastern Europe and especially in Ukraine. You know, we're, we're involved in community transformation, Dale, and, and that is what makes families and children healthy. When we first came into these communities, the kids were not even going to school. I mean, we were in places where the children were wearing summer clothes in the winter. They didn't have a bath all winter long because the river was two miles away and it freezes over in the winter. The parents were illiterate. They were looked down on by society. I, I mean, now we have built bathhouses so people are able to be clean. You know, there's a dignity that comes yeah, with some of yeah. these things that changes the way people not just think about themselves, but the way they see the world. Moms and dads are coming to the schools and learning to read and write. Their kids are, are in school. And when we first went, you just can't imagine the pandemonium of a bunch of gypsy kids who were like little little wild animals, really. They couldn't sit still. That Now they're in class in their chairs. We've built schools. They're sitting in their chairs. They're fed healthy meals each day. Their artwork is on the walls. Um, our, our soccer team one year won the, <laughs> the regional division in, in pajamas because that was the only uniform that came in the, the stuff we brought from America that was consistent enough for everybody to wear the same thing. And then our guys won. I mean, we were, we were amazed. And we've just seen now Roma kids seeing their dad's work in some of these businesses that we've started saying, when I grow up, I want to have a job like my dad. That is totally foreign to what their thinking was before. So we are seeing tremendous transformation in people, in families, in communities, and we're out to change the world with that. 